Thank you for your involvement in the recovery trial. These training slides have been put together for those involved with the paediatric elements of the trial. They discuss the paediatric specific parts of recovery, but they should be reviewed in addition to the training slides for the whole study. These slides were updated in December 2021, but as there are changes being made to the protocol all the time, please make sure you check the current version of the protocol and also the current version of the paediatric frequently asked questions document. The rationale for including children in the recovery trial is that although few children develop severe and life-threatening acute respiratory presentations of COVID, we need a robust evidence base to guide the use of effective treatments and to avoid potential harm from other treatments. We'd recommend that you use the RCPCH treatment criteria to guide the decision about which children need treatment for COVID-19. It's anticipated that any child with COVID-19 being considered for treatment over and above standard of care should be considered for enrolment in recovery. A small proportion of children who are exposed to SARS-CoV-2 go on to develop paediatric inflammatory multi-system syndrome temporarily associated with SARS-CoV-2 or PIMS-TS for short. Children with PIMS-TS who have not responded to first-line treatments are eligible for inclusion in the recovery trial. Hospitalised children with or without COVID-19 may also be infected or co-infected with influenza. New treatment arms have been added to recovery to confirm or rule out effective treatment for children with influenza as well. When recruiting a child or young person to recovery, it's important to make sure you use the correct version of the participant information sheet. For those children who are less than 10 years of age, please provide the child with a younger child information leaflet. They should read this along with their parent or guardian. The parent or guardian should be supplied with a patient information sheet for parents and they are the ones who will sign the consent form. If the child is aged between 10 and 15 years of age, please provide the information sheet for that age range. Children should be given the opportunity to sign the information sheet and this will indicate their assent if they're well enough and the signature is possible. The parent or guardian should read the patient information sheet and sign the consent form. Witness consent may also be used. If the young person is over 16 years of age, they should be provided with the participant information sheet for parents or guardian and guardians and young people over the age of 16. They're the ones who sign the consent form or use witness consent themselves. It's permissible to use witness consent over the telephone or web link if hospital visiting rules or parental infection mean that a parent or guardian cannot physically be present. Within the recovery trial, any healthcare professional with appropriate training and knowledge of the trial is able to take consent. The eligibility criteria for children are the same as those for adults and are listed on this slide. Number one is the child must be hospitalised. This means they can be either admitted with COVID or influenza, or they may have developed one of these infections whilst in hospital. The child should have a viral pneumonia syndrome. In the protocol, you'll see this stated. In general, viral pneumonia should be suspected when a patient presents with A, typical symptoms, for instance, influenza-like illness with fever and muscle pain, or respiratory illness with cough and shortness of breath, and B, compatible chest x-ray findings, that is consolidation or ground glass shadowing, and C, alternative causes sh should have been considered unlikely or excluded. And there is a note that the diagnosis remains a clinical one based on the opinion of the managing doctor. A chest x-ray is not required to make the diagnosis of viral pneumonia and we do not require this to assess eligibility to the recovery trial. Therefore, a chest x-ray should only be done if this is part of the child's clinical care. Children with PIMS TS are also eligible for recovery. These are children with severe PIMS TS who have not responded to initial therapy with intravenous immunoglobulin or corticosteroids. There may also be children for whom IVIG or corticosteroids are considered unsuitable. They are also able to be considered for enrolment in recovery. 
Thirdly, there's a requirement for laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2, that's in all countries of the world, and or influenza A or B, and that's just in the UK only at the current time. So a diagnosis of infection with SARS-CoV-2 and or influenza can be made by PCR or rapid antigen testing. The test may have been performed within the laboratory or using a near patient laboratory test. Also, it's important to note that patients with PIMS TS may or may not have laboratory confirmed evidence of SARS-CoV-2 by PCR, rapid antigen or serology and may still be included in recovery without the need for confirmation of a positive test first. Fourthly, the child should have no medical history that might, in the opinion of the attending clinician, put the patient at significant risk if they were to participate in the trial. This slide gives an overview of the current options available within the recovery trial. As recovery is an adaptive design, there are changes being made to the protocol all the time. Therefore, please make sure you check the current version of the protocol and which options are available in your centre. For those children with confirmed SARS-CoV-2, the options are baricitinib or usual care alone in a one-to-one -one randomization. And those patients with PIMS-TS, the options are tocilizumab, anakinra, and usual care alone in a two-to-two-to-one randomization. For those children with confirmed influenza, these options are available in the UK only. And please only recruit to flu once you're authorised to do so by the coordinating centre. There are three randomizations open antiviral treatments with veloxavir or usual care alone in a one-to-one -one randomizations, a second antiviral with oseltamivir or usual care alone one-to-one -one randomization, or low-dose steroids only open for those children who are hypoxic and SARS-CoV-2 negative in a one-to-one -one randomization. So just considering each of these randomizations in turn, for those children with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 who are greater than or equal to two years of age, who have an acute respiratory presentations of COVID, they should be considered for entry into recovery. As of December 2021, the only option is baricitinib versus usual care alone. Please note that further treatments are being considered for use within recovery, so further options may become available in the coming weeks and months. Please use the RCPCH guidelines to guide your decisions about thresholds for treatment for children with COVID-19. At the current time, those children who are both COVID and flu positive are not eligible for the baricitinib versus usual care randomization. So just to recap, baricitinib is only open to children with acute respiratory presentations of COVID who are greater or equal to two and are influenza negative. For those children with renal impairments, please note there's a dosage adjustment required. Baricitinib can only be used enterally, so that's via um, orally or via an NG tube. This should not be administered via an NJ tube. A pregnancy test is required in females of childbearing potential before randomisation to baricitinib. Baricitinib is given once daily for 10 days or until discharge, whichever is earlier. For those children with influenza, there are three separate randomizations. First option is veloxavir versus usual care, greater or equal than 12 years of age, oseltamivir open in all ages, and low dose steroids in all ages, but only if hypoxic and COVID negative. The reason that children who are SARS-CoV-2 positive um, cannot be enrolled in the low dose corticosteroids steroids is this might be indicated as part of usual care for these children. So veloxavir is only open to children with confirmed influenza A or B who are greater or equal to 12 years of age and greater or equal than 40 kilograms. It's given twice on days one and four and if the child is discharged at home before day four this should be provided as a TTO to be given at home. Veloxavir can be given orally or via enteral administration. It's unsuitable if there's hypersensitivity to veloxavir or any of the excipients. If the child has a known hereditary problem of galactose intolerance, total lactase deficiency or glucose galactose malabsorption is also unsuitable. Veloxavir comes as a tablet. If the child is unable to swallow the tablet and is not suitable for enteral administration, for instance by an NG or NJ tube, 
then the child will not be suitable for a block sphere. This is because the volume um, that it would be need to be given um, by mouth as a suspension is very large. Oseltamivir or Tamiflu is available to children of all ages with confirmed influenza and pneumonia. Within recovery, we don't specify a treatment window from symptom onset to treatment. Tamiflu is available either as a capsule or an oral suspension. It's given twice daily for five days, or if the child is immunocompromised, it should be given for 10 days. These courses should be completed even if the child is discharged from hospital before this time, so this might require TTOs. If a child has renal impairment, dosage adjustment is required. This is further detailed in the Frequently Asked Questions document. Low-dose steroids are open to infants and children with laboratory-confirmed influenza, but only those who have evidence of hypoxia, so that's needing supplemental oxygen or have an SpO2 of less than 92% on air. Low-dose steroids are contraindicated if recent or planned use of systemic corticosteroids or if co-infected with SARS-CoV-2. And the reason for this is because if the child is also co-infected with SARS-CoV-2, steroids might be required as part of usual treatment. Low-dose steroids can be used by the oral or other enteral routes or the, I, the IV route. If they're less than 36 weeks correct, corrected gestational age, please use hydrocortisone twice daily for seven days and then once daily for three days. If the infant's grades are equal to 36 weeks um, and including children and young people, use dexamethasone once daily. Treat for 10 days or until discharge, whichever is sooner. TTOs will not be required. There is no dosage adjustment required for renal failure. Recovery remains open for those children with PIMS TS. For those involved in recovery previously, they'll know this as the second randomization. This is only open to children who are greater or equal to one year of age, who have not already responded to therapy with intravenous IVIG or corticosteroids, or if IVIG or steroids are not considered indicated. The randomization is to topilizumab, anakinra or usual care alone. Please note because of the way the system was initially set up, you must first complete the first form and there will be warned there are no treatments available or suitable and then please after that accept the invitation to proceed directly to the second randomization. Topilizumab should be selected as unsuitable if the patient is less than one year of age, if they have a known hypersensitivity to topilizumab or any of the excipients, if they're known to have hepatitis B or C or TB, if the ALT or AST is greater than three times the upper limit of normal, or they've received a biologic immunomodulator JAK kinase inhibitor within the preceding 30 days. TOKI is given via the intravenous route. Normally it's given just as a single dose, but a second dose may be given greater or equal to 12 hours and less than 24 hours later if in the opinion of the attending clinician, the patient's condition has not improved. Please select anakinra as being unsuitable if the patient's less than one year of age, if they have a known hypersensitivity to anakinra or E. coli derived proteins or to any of the excipients, if they have known hepatitis B or C or TB infection, if the absolute neutrophil count is less than 1.5 times 10 to the 9 per litre, or if they've received biological immunomodulators or JAK kinase inhibitors within the preceding 30 days. Anokinera is given just once daily by the subcutaneous route. Should be given for seven days or until discharge, whichever is soonest. So moving on to think about vaccines now. Those children who've received baricitinib, tocilizumab or anokinera should avoid live or live attenuated vaccines for 12 weeks after the receipt of one of these medications. These vaccines include BCG, rotavirus, MMR, and the live attenuated nasal influenza vaccine. Please note, IM inactivated influenza vaccine is suitable. Please do review the frequently asked questions document. This document contains answers to most questions you might have about the recovery trial for children. The document contains information about each intervention and additional considerations prior to randomization and dosing information. 
This document is found on the recovery website within site teams and then the guides for specific patient groups and select recovery for paediatric patients. This document is frequently updated so please make sure you look at this for the current um, guidelines for the study. Thanks so much for listening.